Good evening and welcome to the June 8th, 2020 work session of the Mayor and City Council. Uh, tonight we have two items for discussion. Uh, the first one is an update on our stormwater program. And then the second one is a presentation on the city's phased service restoration plan. So um, joining us now to give us an update on our stormwater program, we have Beth Forbes, Michael Wayand, and Michael Johnson, all from our public works department. Uh, Beth, Mike, take it away. Thank you. Tonight's update on the stormwater program has three different parts. The first part is for mostly for people at home to explain what stormwater is, why it's important. The second part is about the staff responsibilities um, in the stormwater program. And the third concerns the stormwater program fee and the rate model. Next. So why do we need stormwater? There's two basic objectives. One is water quality and one is water quantity. So for water quality, we are dealing with contaminants. And a lot of times people think of those as chemicals, but it also can be nutrients like phosphorus and, and um, nitrogen. For water quantity, we're talking about slowing down the rate of flow after it rains. So this is flooding and to reduce erosion on the stream banks. Next. And so when we talk about water quality, we want to soak the water through a filter. It could be the soil, it could be sand, it could be a, a proprietary device underneath the ground that you don't even see. When we're talking about water quantity, next, then we're using some sort of control to slow down the water so it doesn't overwhelm our streams. Next. So water quantity is a pretty local concept, but water quality has far ranging uh, regional impacts. This photo of the Chesapeake Bay from a satellite shows um, a snow pack at the northern part of Maryland. And next, when that snow melted a few weeks later, it brought with it all sorts of sediment, so much sediment that you can see it from a satellite photo. Next. The, the type of surface the rain falls on impacts how much storm water you get. The city is about 39% impervious. So when the water falls on things like turf or trees, it tends to not run off immediately into the streams. Uh, it stays on the leaves of the trees, it gets um, evaporated. Whereas when water falls on the 61% of the city that's impervious, it tends to run off very quickly and take some of the pollutants that might be in on our, on our roads or our rooftops or parking lots with it into the streams. So the amount of impervious surface is very important when we're talking about stormwater. The next slide has uh, some stormwater management practices that you can see around the city. The top row are conventional structural practices and the bottom row are more alternative practices. The top right is a bioretention facility on Rabbit Road. So the engineered soil um, collects the rainwater from the road and filters it and the plants take up the nutrients. That's a quality control de device or practice. The center top photo is a dry pond, which sounds like an oxymoron, but when it rains, this pond takes all the runoff from the nearby hard surfaces, the rooftops and the roads, and this pond fills up and slowly over a day or two, the water gets into the stream, but not so far as, as much as to um, erode the stream banks. The top right-hand photo is the pond at Rio. A wet pond uh, can provide both water quality and quantity control. On the lower left is the city street sweeper, and that's one of the ways to get credits toward our MS4 program is to remove the contaminants from the stream, from the streets before they get to the stream. You can get credits for that. The center photo is a storm drain inlet, and these tend to collect debris. We have a storm drain cleaning program, but we haven't really talked about yet how to get credits from that. The bottom right picture is a stream restoration of Medi Branch that's near West Deer Park. And if you're not viewing this on a tablet, you might be able to see the stone on the left bank, and that's keeping 
the muddy branch from further eroding the stream bank, and that can get water quality credits for that. Next. So I'd like my final slide in the first section, I want to go over just some history of stormwater. 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed, and that's a National Water Quality Act, but that doesn't come into play in Gaithersburg for a little while. In 1975, Gaithersburg had its first stormwater program, and it was a water quantity program. So if you see subdivisions from that era, you'll see a lot of dry ponds, as because that's what stormwater was back then. In 1985, the entire state was required to have a quantity program. Um, in the 90s, the EPA uh, started regulating jurisdictions. In the 70s and 80s, they mostly focused on point sources from industry, from factories, and from wastewater treatment plants. But in the 90s, they started looking at stormwater, runoff, the contaminants from stormwater, as being a point source. And they started regulating larger jurisdictions with more than 100,000 population. In the 2000s, they started regulating smaller jurisdictions. In 2003, Gaithersburg got its first permit, and at that same time signed on with Montgomery County government's water quality protection charge to help pay for the requirements. When we knew the second permit was coming soon, we hired a consultant to give us some um, recommendations for charging a stormwater program fee. And in 2015, the city started the program fee when it knew that the second permit was on its way. The second permit, the second generation permit got here in 2018. Next. So now I'm going to talk about what the staff in the stormwater program do. One of the things they do is work on the MS4 phase two permit. MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit. And phase two means we're a smaller jurisdiction. It's a five-year permit, and it has two years at the end to cover um, finishing up projects that might have gotten delayed along the way. There's two primary requirements, and one is to meet six minimum control measures, and the other is to restore 20% of the untreated impervious surfaces. So last year, we used the GIS, and we figured out where all the facilities were now and what they were what impervious area they were treating and then we could see what impervious area wasn't getting treated and and figured out what how many acres of untreated impervious surfaces we would need to get treated in the five-year period next so there's annual reporting with this permit for year one was fy19 we submitted our report last fall with our impervious baseline and a work plan like how we were going to get to meet our acreage goal. And this year in October, we'll report on FY20. We'll update our baseline and our restoration plan. And the second and fourth years, we're required to report on MCMs. Next. So what is an MCM? One example is an illicit discharge detection and elimination program. So we need to inspect all the outfalls to make sure there isn't any illicit discharge going on into our storm drain system. We need to have a program for people to report hazardous waste spills and, and methods to clean them up. Some photos here are a the oil spill at the Old Town Garage on the right. The top left is an algae bloom in the pond at Rio that probably happened when someone used too much fertilizer. And the bottom left is paint that got found its way into a micro pool. That's a water quality control device practice in um, Victory Farm. Next. Another MCM is having a public outreach and education program. So each year we have Green Up Day and Green Month. We also man the booths at different festivals throughout the year. We need to keep track of how many times we talk to people, how many people show up at our stream cleanup events. Next. Another part of the outreach is a Chesapeake Bay Trust grant partnership. So the city provides the funds and the Chesapeake Bay Trust administers the grants. And we reach out to uh, nonprofits throughout the city to help them fund watershed outreach programs and restoration projects. 
next. And here's some of the nonprofits that, that have been funded over the last couple of years. There's a sister program to this, this nonprofit program called Rainscapes. And we offer um, some funding to help people put in rain barrels or bioretention facilities at their own houses on single family and townhouses. Next. Another part of the stormwater program is making sure that all the new development meets the state, stand, state stormwater design manual. So we review plans and work well with um, the plan, planning and code administration. This photo is a bioretention facility at FedEx. Uh, we also support the city's projects to make sure that their stormwater um, requirements are met. Um, the chapter eight of the city code is where all the requirements for the stormwater program and IDD are. And one of the things we're looking at is to propose amendments to that to bring chapter eight up to date. And we hope to bring that to you by the end of the year. And uh, next, another part of the things that this, we do here in the stormwater group um, are the storm drains, because there's storm drains that bring the, the rainwater to the facilities and from the facilities back out to the stream. Most of them are concrete and or corrugated metal. The concrete ones tend to have problems when the joints come loose. And the picture here is within the city of Gaithersburg, but it's on private property. And the joints between two segments of concrete pipe have come loose and made a big sinkhole. The water it's no longer conveying water to the stream. So this is where we work with neighborhood services with private property who need to um, rehab some of their stormwater infrastructure. The corrugated metal pipes were very popular in the 60s and 70s, and those are pretty much at the end of their useful life. So that's something um, that we want to look into replacing. Next, we have a number of state regulated dams in the city. Uh, all of them need to be inspected and made sure there's no vegetation on the embankments that could um, cause the embankments to fail and be a safety issue. The larger ponds uh, get inspected by the state every year and the state also expects us to update our emergency action plans for each of those. The picture on the bottom right is a concrete pipe that's under Edison Park Drive. Um, from the inside, it looks like this joint is leaking. So there's a lot of repairs with these larger, larger facilities too. Next, we respond to drainage issues when citizens call. Um, we do monitoring of our stream restoration projects. This is Mike at Muddy Branch. We need to go out annually to show that the, the restoration is stable. So that's the end of my second part. Uh, the third part of my presentation concerns the stormwater program fee and its rate model. So a lot of the program fee goes to pay for the MS4 permit costs, um, primarily delivering the new capital facilities needed to get to that 20% goal. But they, we also need to validate the current facility. So the facilities that we said is already treating the impervious area, we need to make sure, we need to inspect them and validate them, make sure that they really actually are providing the treatment that they do. We might have to make some decisions whether it's not worth it to continue to count a, a particular facility. It might be cheaper instead of retrofitting a facility is to, to have another project, a capital project someplace else. We need to think about how the state's credit accounting is going to change. Uh, we got our permit issued in April 2018 and a year, I think then even a month later, no, a year later, they, they changed how stream restorations are credited. It used to be like you got one acre credit for every 100 feet you restored and then they changed it to you get three acres of credit for every 100 feet. So there have been other changes like that. We could probably expect some other changes in the credit accounting over the term of the permit. Uh, these alternative credits like street sweeping aren't quite the same as, as the facilities. We need to, to tell them each year how much street sweeping we do and, and then they average it over the five-year permit term. 
Whereas if we have a build facility, we inspect it every three years and it gets that credit that area is considered, considered treated as long as the facility is operating properly. We'd like to look at having some grant program projects, be able to get credits for our program. Next. Um, the bottom line with these credits is it's um, not a straight line. It's not like we're here and we're going there. There's going to be a lot of iterations over the permit term. So next, there's other program costs that we haven't really talked about. Um, we touched on the inspections a little bit, but there are other minimum control measures. We talked about the storm drain and dam repairs. We had watershed studies done for the entire city in 2013 and 14, and they recommended some of the capital projects that we're working on now. But if we're gonna be looking out for like another five or 10 years on what the, the rate should be, we sh might want to um, include some funding for additional watershed plans because the ones we have will be like 10 or 15 years old by that time. Last week, you approved a, a new project in the CIP for a headwater dr um, drainage study. And so that's another thing that we'll, we use our funds for. And we talked about development review. So in 2014, when we had a consultant um, determine what's a good, how to organize a rate model, they used a number of assumptions. And if we go to the next slide, here are some of the things that they, they assumed. Um, because the city is pay go, they thought the stormwater fund should have some capital and operating reserves. So over the first five years, they plan to, they suggested and we adopted to, to collect seven years of program costs. So in case we needed a reserves for some reason, we would have them. They assumed that the permits after the second generation permit that was underway would also be another 20% of the impervious area, another 20%. And um, uh, that was an assumption they made. They assumed that the asset management program would start in the first year. We would start an inlet and culvert cleaning program the first year. The inspection program would be start in the second year and pipe replacement in the third year. They used the capital project cost estimates from the watershed studies to figure out what the capital project delivery costs would be over the five years. And they assumed it would be fully staffed. But the reality was a little different. Next slide. The reserves were collected, but now we know that the future permit is not likely to be another 20% impervious area treated. The asset management program should start soon. The inlet culvert program didn't begin when year one, but it's been underway for a while. The inspection program has been intermittent. We, we're starting that up now pretty full steam. The pipe replacement program was never started. Some of the costs from the watershed plans were spot on, but others were a little bit underestimated and we haven't always been fully staffed. So we would like to uh, hire a consultant to give us some recommendations for updating our stormwater fee model uh, sometime this summer, and then come back to you in the fall with suggestions for a couple different scenarios for the rate model for the future. Next. One thing we recommend being the same is using the same impervious surface billing methodology. So right now for every 500 square feet of impervious area on a property, that's one billing unit. And each year the mayor and council sets the billing unit for the, the following fiscal year. We'd like them to update our programs costs and our assumptions that we made, anticipate the future costs and help us better understand how these how the path to getting to our 20% goal is going to be a series of iterations. We want to develop a few different rate scenarios with the consultant and present them to you in the fall. But one thing we need your input from today is how to deal with HOAs. So when a property is subdivided, the developer is required to put all the stormwater controls on the property as, as part of getting his approvals. 
those at a, on a subdivision, it's usually passed on to the HOA to maintain and, and operate. There's two different kinds of maintenance. One is the structural maintenance. That's the more expensive maintenance. That's removing the sediment, replacing a concrete that might be spalled, something like that. Then there's the aesthetic maintenance, which is um, keeping the area mowed, keeping the vege vegetation off the embankment, and, and removing the trash. So next slide. What we've seen is that um, sometimes the city has gone in and assisted different HOAs. They've retrofit HOA ponds. They've taken over HOA ponds completely. I've found recently some instances where the HOA actually never operated and owned the pond. The property with the pond was conveyed to the city even before the HOA was formed. We've had some HOAs request assistance because the city has helped other HOAs. And before we start doing something along those lines, we want the mayor and council to approval and we want to make sure it's as equ equitable as possible. Um, we might, um, there's some, there's one jurisdiction that has taken over all HOA, but um, that's, that's certainly on the table. But you could also um, decide to take over a certain type of facility. You could decide to take over um, facilities that can be retrofit in, and get credits towards our, our MS4 permit. Or another thing you might want to look at is um, a HOA's ability to pay for the retrofits because we know that there are some small HOAs out there that have a facility that's past its useful life. It would really have to be completely rebuilt and that HOA probably doesn't have the funding to do that. Uh, what we do know is that there are four HOA retrofits that are in the capital budget now that, that are owned by H um, different HOAs. And when I say HOAs, there, I think there's one or two condominium associations that also have these. So when I use the term HOA, it can be either. So we would like to have the consultant look at a no action alternative and two or three different options for um, assisting HOAs with their facilities. Next slide. So here's a couple of ideas. One you could do where the city takes over the structural maintenance of all HOA facilities, but the HOAs continue to mow them and remove trash. That will have an impact on the stormwater program fee, and that's what we would have the, the consultant look at. Next. Another option would be for the city to fund and manage a retrofit of the facilities that aren't um, operating to standards. And then once that is done, the HOA would continue all the maintenance, structural maintenance and the mowing and trash. And that would have an impact to the stormwater fee too. Next. And this one is the no action um, alternative where HOAs retain the full ownership and maintenance responsibility. And the city would probably have to spend a little bit more time enforcing um, the, the stormwater requirements on some of the HOAs, which should have little or no impact on the stormwater fee. So next slide. So where we open it up to um, your suggestions. What kind of HOA options should we give to the consultant? And any other parameters you might be interested in looking at when we have the consultant look at updating our rate model. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, I'll start off with the first uh, thank you for putting together the this presentation. Um, it's been a while since we've we've dived into stormwater, um, no pun intended, and uh, I think it's it's such a big program. It's such a big requirement uh, to meet these uh, to get this permit um, that it's very healthy that we periodically discuss it in detail. Um, so I guess my question is, if we were to assume, let's just assume we took on all of the um, stormwater facilities, HOA or not, all the ones in the city, what's, is there an estimated financial impact to that? 
Well, that's what we want them, the consultant to tell us. We want to give them like two or three different scenarios and they would figure out, use some assumptions again, but give us an idea of how that would impact the fee rate. Yeah, I think as it, it would be nice if we could work with the HOAs and the HOAs could self fund the um, upkeep, the maintenance and the, and the retrofitting of their stormwater facilities. I don't know how realistic that is or not. Um, I, you know, I speak from, uh, I'm in one of those small HOAs. I'm not, I, I don't know if we have any stormwater facilities in this, in this uh, community or not, but um, I know that there's a certain amount of reserves that our HOA keeps on, on hand. And there's a limitation to how much the HOA is allowed to raise dues each year. Um, and so if we were hit with this unexpected thing, it'd be very, very difficult for the HOA to meet that requirement. So just as a matter of practicality, it could be very difficult. The other, the other issue I look at in that scenario is, um, I don't know how the state or how we're, how we're supposed to be uh, measuring outcomes of this 20% reduction. Um, but if HOA, you know, HOA facilities are obviously contributing to uh, the quality and the quantity of stormwater that's going through the system. Uh, and so I don't know if that would like impact our ability to meet the, the requirement. I don't know. But uh, obviously, you know, as, as you said, as, as we're as a pay as you go government, we have, we have this nice tradition and, and the unfortunate part about this is there's an unknown cost. The only thing we know is that there are large costs of, uh, associated with this uh, retrofitting. Um, so I guess I would want to see, I'd want to see the, one of the options would be if we, if we just um, took on all of the responsibility for the uh, retrofitting of these stormwater facilities, and then we can break it down in some other ways too. But at least we should know what the sort of the worst case scenario is. Neil, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think um, I, I'd caveat. I, I'd agree with everything you just said, with one caveat that when you say all, we don't want to be responsible for collecting the trash and mowing the lawns around these facilities, all right? I think the HOAs are already doing that and have probably wired that into their cost models, but the rest should definitely be considered. Um, is it okay if I continue and ask a couple of questions? Go right ahead. All right, thanks. Um, two things. One is that in your presentation, you said that going back to, I think it was 2003, we opted into a countywide water quality charge of some kind. Um, and in uh, more recent times, we added our own fee for the stormwater programs that we're doing directly. Is that original water quality charge still in effect or did we replace it with our own charge? We replaced it with our own charge, but the county still charges that same water quality con protection charge. Do they, they charge it to residents of Gaithersburg? No. Okay, that's fine. That's what I was looking for. All right, and the other question, is kind of a big picture question on the money side. Um, in the original stormwater program that we put in place, as you mentioned, we agreed to collect seven years worth of money over five years to build up a two-year reserve. So on that basis, even if costs go up uh, for uh, what we need to do for, to another 20% or whatever we're asked to do or if we take on extra stormwater facilities like the HOAs presumably we wouldn't want to we wouldn't need to build higher reserves so the cost should be somewhat balanced by that I would expect is that seem reasonable seems reasonable all right that's all all I can hope for at this point all right thank you you're welcome great, great presentation by the way that was a really good background and you know covered all the bases thank you I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go to Mike, then Rob, then Ryan. All right. So I, you know, I, it, it, uh, it was a very nice presentation, uh, uh, pretty complete and comprehensive. I just have a couple of questions that I, that you didn't cover. Um, 
you know, I think I probably know the answers, but I think it's it's important for uh, the rest of the council and the and the public to know about. So, um, we have uh, not just HOAs, but we also have businesses, and we also have public entities such as MCPS, the state, and the county, who also have to manage uh, stormwater on their property. Uh, what's our relationship with them in terms of? uh they're a support of our fee as i recall they don't provide any of the the they don't pay any of the fees correct and that's a good question for dennis okay so and well related to that how and in their own management how much of their management causes might cause problems for us or their lack thereof so you're talking about the county or the MCPS? I'm talking about all of that, all of those entities that aren't the city or a, a private entity, a homeowner or HOA. Or, or HOAs or, well, they all get inspected. And I guess that's one of the things we need to, to do with in this permit term is have an MOU with DEP because they need to inspect their facilities on their properties and MCPS properties and make sure we have that information so we can include it in our annual report. Yes, those facilities were inspected. Okay, but that should be done at no cost to the city then, right? For, for county and- Yeah, for their own management. Yes. They, you know, we're not gonna incur any, any cost for their management responsibilities, right? Right. Okay. So Mike, the go back and address your question about um, which entities pay the fee. We mm -hmm. actually have a MOU or a memorandum of understanding with the county for just county properties. They do pay the fee um, assessed by the city. Uh, they pay it as a straight fee usually every year. Uh, we bill them collectively rather than on each parcel. Uh, the school district uh, believes they are exempt from the fee. Uh, so that's always been a discussion point. So they do not pay any of the fees associated uh, with the school site. Any other entity like WSSC um, or you know, the electric company, Pepco, they would pay their fee um, for just like any other person would based upon the calculation. As Beth kind of pointed out, uh, they do their own inspections, at least the county does uh, their own inspections and then WSSC is required to do some inspections because they have industrial permits. Uh, so most of that cost is, is covered by their own entity, not by the city. Uh, oh, so let me follow up then. That, I mean, that's all good to know and I think I recall most of that, but I think it was important for everybody to hear that again. So this issue about taking over a facility uh, from, uh, from an HOA, and I guess we're at, you know, the, the range of what we've done here varies, I believe. Um, so when we do that, is there an upfront uh, cost that we expect them to reimburse the city uh, for, for us doing that? Or is there an annual uh, cost that we expect an HOA to provide, even if it's uh, um, minimal? Uh, you know, to recognize that the city, that basically the taxpayer of the city are subsidizing their facility and their, their stormwater management. That could be an alternative to look at. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'd like to point out, there are some large subdivisions that don't have stormwater controls because when they were subdivided, they said that a regional city pond would be providing their stormwater. Right. So, that becomes an issue like you're charging one HOA for the city to, to handle their stormwater just because they did have a facility at one time that the city and then there's another subdivision that never had them because they used the cities so but doesn't every resident in that in that community that neighborhood pay pay a fee they all pay a fee they all pay a fee correct so in a way I mean I live in a non HOA community neighborhood and as you know I, I assume we are all all of my neighbors are all paying the same fee or you know close to it and that's what the city uses to maintain the facilities that um, uh, you know that they're that the city's responsible for so you know in a way everybody pays 
uh, whether the, the facility is owned by the HOA or by or managed by the city. And I guess presumably if we take it over, then we become the owners of the facility. That's an option. So there has been one HOA where we retrofit two of their ponds, but they re retain ownership and they retain the structural maintenance too. Okay. So yeah, and I think the, the maintenance that we talked about, grass cutting, trash removal, et cetera, should be that responsible. They're responsible, especially if we don't become the owners of it. So. But this one particular HOA that did get retrofit, they're doing all their maintenance. Okay. They're responsible for the structural maintenance and the aesthetic ma maintenance. So whether, yeah, so that kind of uh, agreement between us and another, and a community like that is going to be different than one where they just say, we're going to wash our hands of this, no pun intended, and hand it over to the city, right? Well, it's up to the mayor. It's up to us. <laughs> which which options you want to look at and which ones you want to choose. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go to Rob and then Ryan and then Lori in. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, um, and thanks, Beth, for your presentation. It's very informative. I don't have much to add. Um, actually, just to follow up on what Mike was talking about. So under the current structure where um, residents pay impervious surface fees, the stormwater match fees based on their impervious surfaces, and then HOAs are paying to maintain um, either structural or cosmetic, whatever the agreement may be. Are the HOAs in fact paying more than because their residents are paying the stormwater management fees and then they're also paying HOA fees to maintain structural and aesthetic um, um, aspects that are within their jurisdiction? Yes, we do have a program of stormwater fee credits, but so far only one subdivision has applied and been approved. So they have to have an engineer inspect it, say that it, it's operating as it's designed, it is treating that area, and then we run through the, after you approve the budget and that we have a new stormwater credit uh, rate, we run through all the new impervious area and figure out what their credits are going to be. Okay, and, and so that'll just play into what, what my overarching concern would be um, for, for the various options. I support the three options that you are suggesting is whatever we think about at the, at the city level has to be equitable across the city. Um, and, but in order to do that, we need the facts and the data to figure out what the right course of action is. So thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Thanks, Rob, we'll go to Ryan. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, my concerns are similar to what Mike and Rob have already raised. Um, we're at this point being asked to consider a very limited question of uh, what you know potential models we might want to see more information about, and that's all, as opposed to making a decision on which of those models we actually want to adopt. And um, you know, I'm I'm concerned with equity as well. But you can look at this in a lot of different ways from a lot of different angles. What Mike was saying earlier, and I think the point that Rob was trying to underscore is, yes, everybody pays the stormwater fee uh, based on their uh, impervious surface on their lot, but people who live in HOAs, at least theoretically, also pay their HOA dues and fees, which go towards, at least in part, in theory, towards the maintenance uh, of uh, stormwater infrastructure owned uh, by the HOA that the HOA is responsible for. So. You could make the argument that people who live in HOAs, um, assuming that the HOA is actually doing the maintenance and collecting uh, a fee from uh, its residents uh, and applying that fee appropriately, that they're sort of being, for lack of a better word, double taxed. Uh, for, yeah, it's not a tax, Ryan. It's not a tax. It's not a tax. not a tax. But they're being charged basically once for the city stormwater fee and once uh, separately for the HOA maintenance. And we may decide that for a variety of reasons that's okay because the stormwater fee goes to the collective overall needs of the city to deal with its stormwater management obligations and uh, improvement of the environment uh, and the waterways. Um, but we sort of need to figure out how we're going to acknowledge that reality. Um, that's the first sort of question and whether or not there's an equity element there. Uh, the second, uh, in my view, is um, how does this all uh, sort of relate to those non-residential uh, private property or other governmental uh, properties that Mike talked about, 
uh, for um, uh, stormwater facilities that they might uh, take advantage of uh, within the city that aren't necessarily owned and operated either by the city government or by a residential HOA. Um, and, you know, how do we deal with the distinction, if it's even possible to make the distinction between those HOAs who have not been able to maintain or retrofit or upgrade uh, their stormwater facilities uh, through no fault of their own because of all kinds of external factors, and lack of resources from those who might have been able to, but just didn't do it. Um, and, you know, should we even be getting into the weeds of trying to distinguish between them? Because, um, you know, I, I think there are probably some who fit into some one category and some who might arguably fit into another. And there are HOAs out there um, who have already invested in trying to meet those requirements. And how do we acknowledge their prior investment if we're going to bail out other HOAs who haven't made that investment? So it becomes very complicated when we're trying to treat everybody as equitably as we can while still acknowledging the idea of having a stormwater management uh, fund and a permit and a process that is citywide is not about trying to serve any one particular subdivision or any one particular subsection of the city. It's really about meeting the city's overall goals. And so you sort of have to separate it out. So between that challenge and all these other questions that I have, I just am a little queasy about the idea of us coming in uh, and, and taking over, you know, uh, whatever uh, facilities might need to be taken over, regardless of how they got to that point, uh, without really carefully figuring out, you know, what is the uh, fiscal impact and what is the fairness question uh, for uh, residents of our city who live in, in different uh, uh, accommodations, different setups with HOAs or not with HOAs. And, uh, and how they've managed to either invest or not invest in stormwater infrastructure over time. So I'm just a little hesitant about it. Do I think at this point it would be okay for a consultant to come in and at least price it out and show us what it looks like? Sure, that's fine. But when it comes time to make that decision, I just, I think we ought to think really carefully uh, before we uh, jump, you know, uh, you know, with both feet into that, into that, uh, possibility of having to take over every single uh, private HOA stormwater facility in the city. I think that's going to be a really, really big um, uh, challenge if we have to do that. Um, and I'll just take a moment uh, to uh, plug uh, the fact that if we had something like a commission on common ownership communities that applied in the city of Gaithersburg, <laughs> maybe we'd have a little bit more training and support for those uh, homeowners association boards that would have had to deal with this in the past that weren't able to. Uh, so something to think about as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. We'll go to Lori Ann. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you again for the presentation. I thought it was very thorough and informative. I don't want to repeat some of the questions of my colleagues, but um, I just was curious about what the uh, associated cost, the fiscal impact of each option would be. And since I don't know how long this uh, consultant's work will take to survey, assess, determine repairs for each of the HOAs, will we share those costs? I think Ryan mentioned, depending on what, um, uh, where the uh, actual um, stormwater facility, like what their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like what, a, how many improvements need to be made to uh, the particular facilities and how that varies across um, HOA and condo facilities. Um, and so I think it's, I agree that the three options are um, really good to consider. And I don't know if I can necessarily make a decision until we see like what the fiscal impacts of each option um, would be and how those fees would be spread across each HOA. And are we sharing in the cost to get them ready and then a, f a flat fee afterwards or that's, that's what I'm still 
confused about? So the three options that I presented are three of many, many options, just to give you an idea of the range of them. So that I would think you would always keep the no action option as one of your three or four different options. So I've given you two others as just possibilities, but you could really look at pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. um, so how long will it be before? At a, at a particular size, you would, you know, if you had so many members in the HOA, we would. If you had a larger HOA, we wouldn't. There mm -hmm. dozens of different iterations. I just gave a couple. So we hope to give, but we don't want to have a, the, the consultant look at two dozen different options, even okay. though there's probably more than that. So we want to have your input on, on outlining two or three different ones that they'll actually work through the costs. And so I don't think they're going to, to like look at any one particular facility or any one HOA, but just as a general uh, appraisal of different ways you could go ab about organizing your rate model with different HOA policies. Okay, and are we also looking at other jurisdictions to see how they are managing so that when we get this information, we can compare it, how they are? We only know one jurisdiction who's taken over all their HOA facilities, whenever the HOA facilities. I used to manage projects for that jurisdiction. They took over a lot of facilities that they thought could be retrofit. And when they got into design, they got 30 to 60% design. They realized they couldn't meet dam standards. They, it was gonna be a high hazard dam. They didn't wanna deal with that. So they had, to, they had a lot of sunk costs in the design on on things um the maintenance people weren't very happy with having to maintain really facilities that were past their life mm. life cycle but they had uh, agreed to take them on and they were maintaining things that really needed to be completely retrofit but they couldn't be retrofit and get credits they could be dismantled or they could be retrofit just for a quantity but there was no way in the space available to get want quality credits for a retrofit for these. Okay. So how long do you think the process would take on average for the consultant to do this work and assess the three options we're proposing and come back to us? We've been we're scoping out a contract for them. We hope to get a consultant on board this summer and come back in the fall and present the uh, Findings. next version of the rate model. Okay. And probably with a couple different HOA options to choose from. Okay, good. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Lorraine. Dennis uh, and Mike Johnson. So these three options seem seem fine. I, and we'll, well, I'm going to get to in a second, Neil. These three options seem fine. I, you know, given that it's not this kind of um, evaluation, we can, we all see the value in in it, and, and some very good points have been brought up about costs and about equity. Um, if there are any, in your professional opinion, uh, if, as we move toward getting this consultant, any other options um, that you think would make sense? I I think it would, it would we would appreciate it. Uh, keeping in mind the comments that you've gotten about about costs and about equity and about uh, practicability and all that kind of stuff. Do you guys feel comfortable just sort of eyeballing it and if you have some other kind of solutions that take some of these things into consideration that maybe we would add to these three options? Um, hi, hi Mary. Uh, yes we do. Um, you know we we had a a portfolio of options, as Beth mentioned, and we sort of narrowed it down to those three. But with the feedback that we got from council, which was very, uh, good, very good discussion, it sort of you know, helped us to sort of um, identify. Will help us to identify additional options that we could have the consultant look at or refine. Maybe not totally new options, but maybe a refinement to an existing option. And our goal would be to be able to come back to you in the fall, to come back to you in the fall where we have, you know, you can sort of look at the different what if scenarios. So that if you took over HOAs and parse, parse them by size, even if that's a very blunt way to do it, like if you took like Hidden Creek, which is a large, large HOA versus some of the, the, the tinier ones, which have, um, ex, you know, extensive um, structural practices on the ground, 
Um, there, there has to be, maybe you'll end up with like an index, some kind of a, a cost index that ultimately allows for a rational decision to be made. And then once we present that to you, our goal is to really uh, give you information so you can help us formulate the policy that would make it into chapter eight and allow us to execute. Sounds good. Thank you, Michael. Um, Neil, you had your hand up. Yeah, I have a, a, a big question and then a comment. So let's start with the big question first. Um, so MCPS and uh, Montgomery County government say that they are exempt. I'm, I'm not sure if Montgomery County is correct, but I know MCPS believes that they're exempt from our stormwater fees. Um, does that mean that they are required to perform their own work comparable to what we need to do under our permit? And if that's the case, should they just not be counted as part of our uh, acreage? It's a little bit more, I'll let Beth kind of explain because uh, there's underlying, there's actually multiple permits uh, within the jurisdiction of the corporate boundaries. So yes, they are responsible for uh, their own maintenance. And Beth can kind of talk a little bit about some of the complexities that all the jurisdictions are running into when you have multiple permits um, in a given particular area. Um, so are you saying that MCPS has a, a permit of their very own? Yes, MCS has a permit that's actually administered by the county um, at this particular point in time. And then the county has their, also has their own permit. Mm -hmm. um, and in reality, WSSC has their own permit. Uh, state Highway has their own permit. So when the state set this up, it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, every permit excludes all the other permits. Beth, you might add a little bit more in terms of what complexity that is added to uh, the process. Well, most of these properties inside the city count against our impervious acreage. So even though they're a permittee, it's, it's still part of our impervious surface. Even though they have their own permit and are required to do their own work, does their permit only cover ground in unincorporated parts of the county or how does that work? It sounds like the, whoever the permitting agency is, is double dipping here or something along those lines. I agree, it's confusing. Okay. It's one of the unresolved issues with the phase two permits. Because um, a lot of the other entities are actually phase one permittees and we're a phase two permitting. Yeah, I would think that the position that I would recommend uh, off the top of my head would be uh, that we shouldn't be responsible, so it shouldn't count as, against our permit, but I'll let you guys deal with that. Um, so let me come to my comment, which is the discussion about, about equity and fairness in terms of taking over the other facilities. Um, basically, my position is the, the uh, excuse me, I have to say goodnight to my son. Good night, Sam. Stop. All right, go, go. All right, excuse me for the interruption. Apparently one of our fire uh, smoke detectors is beeping and is bothering him too, so I'm gonna may have to disappear for a moment. Um, so the comment is that I think we should consider the status quo today for all HOAs and faci city facilities to be equitable, basically every community, every subdivision that was created, every common ownership community. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Sam. I'm in the middle of something, thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, I think we should consider the status quo to be fair. Every, uh, every community that was created, there was a negotiation between the developer and the city that resulted in the current situation and everybody was comfortable with it at the time. Um, so that that makes that'll make it simpler to say, you know, every every relationship that we want to build with a common ownership community, uh, in terms of taking over a facility potentially, would be a one-off negotiation about what's involved in taking on their facility, uh, what the costs might be, what the current status is, and things like that. And uh, so I don't think worrying about what went on in the past and who's got what facilities is, is a useful exercise. I think we just wanna worry about what happens going forward. Um, and the second point in terms of 
the value of even considering taking on other facilities is that many of these homeowners, uh, home ownership communities um, are probably not capable of uh, properly maintaining these facilities going forward, especially with the new standards. They're probably more expensive and engineering wise, more complex than a smaller common ownership community could really be expected to deal with. So uh, from that point of view, if we want the stormwater to be taken care of properly, uh, it behooves us to get involved to some level. If an inspector comes through and says that the system is failing, um, I don't think leaving it to a small HOA would be uh, likely to be result in the kind of outcome that we're looking for. All right, that's it, thanks. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised at this point, but I this would normally be the time where I would call for uh, testimony from the public, but um, nobody has signed up. I will, I will remind everybody who's watching um, that we will take your comp, you, you can email in your comments and we'll consider them just like any written, any um, oral testimony. So um, just send it to city hall at gaithersburgmd.gov. Um, does anybody have any uh, final comments or questions before we move on to the next discussion item? Not seeing any? Okay, thank you all very much. Beth, Michael, Michael, appreciate it guys. Great presentation. Thank you. Good night. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the city's planned uh, reopening, and Dennis is going to lead us in that presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, tonight, I wanted to provide an update on the city's phased restoration service plans uh, to you and to the community. Um, the presentation I'm making tonight is actually a condensed version of what you can find in the Mayor and City Council packet information and will be posted on the city's website. Uh, of course, you know, as part of the COVID-19 pandemic, the city has been able to maintain its essential services and continue to offer a wide range of services through virtual connections uh, with the community. We believe the health and safety of our employees and the residents is the highest priority uh, for the city. And as the state and Montgomery County begin to allow for greater activity under uh, their respective executive orders, the city will gradually begin restoring services that have been put on hold. Next slide. Over the past couple of months, staff has been actively preparing for reopening of our facilities. We have been cleaning the facilities, sourcing and ordering PPE or personal protection equipment. Uh, appropriate wellness sneeze guards and shields have been installed and we have developed specific operational plans for each of the departments. As we move forward into uh, the phases, the city will be following the advice and direction of both the state of Maryland and Montgomery County Health Departments. And we have been actively reviewing CDC and OSHA guidelines as they are developed and provided to us. I do wanna stress that the plan presented tonight is still very fluid and we will need to adapt to changing conditions uh, we encounter um, during the COVID epidemic. And we'll be making updates to this presentation um, through the website um, should we need to. Tonight, I'm gonna present some the general um, phasing along with some specific comments about community events, and then kind of go over some of the highlights of each of the facilities um, that you'll see um, in our organization. Phase one, which will begin on June 15th, um, will have the opening of core buildings such as the activity center, city hall, police station, public works through appointments. We will also still be asking individuals to conduct business through our virtual platforms to the extent feasible. And the legislative meetings such as the mayor and city council meetings and the planning commission will continue to be held virtually. We've also begun to restart committee meetings in a virtual platform through the use of teleconference calls. Next slide. In terms of phase one, uh, we will be asking for standard safety protocols um, from the residents when they visit sites and they would be required to wear uh, face masks, uh, 
practice physical distancing and, a, and we would be adhering to additional cleaning measures. As part of phase two, next slide. It is important um, to note that when we go to phase two, not all the services will be available at the very beginning of phase two. There are a number of variable start dates depending on the circumstances. We have not yet determined a date, start date for phase two, but in core buildings, we would be allowing the public to attend in a walk-in basis. No more appointments would be required. The city would also open up additional facilities such as the youth centers for specific uses. And while meetings will likely continue virtually for a while, the city will begin to reevaluate whether we can safely hold them in person and on what type of meetings and gathering criteria that are in place by the state or Montgomery County. Next slide. We will continue to ask the residents to abide by safety protocols um, in place, such as the face, uh, face masks and physical distancing and additional cleaning measures will still be in place uh, during phase two. The next slide, which covers phase three, this is anticipated to be uh, the new normal operations where the city facilities will be open as they were previous to the COVID epidemic. We all know that things are changing in our own environments, and so we do anticipate um, some minor changes to how we operate, hopefully to the better, where we allow more services that are online and those continue to be offered online. There may be the need for still health and safety protocols. Uh, we just don't know at this time. On the next slide, as we move through, again, I just want to reiterate many of the services we've already been providing in a virtual um, capacity, and we will continue to explore um, those services and continue them as we move through the phases. You, you can get more information on our website at gaithersburgmd.gov. And as I indicated before, I just really want to stress because again, all of this is predicated on having some knowledge of how the state or the county is going to move forward in their own phases, um, that we will be basing this on their recommendations and that we may need to make additional requirements within our own city um, to restore services in a phased fashion. Next slide. In terms of special events, uh, as you know, decisions will be made on an individual basis for all future events. We did make some announcements today. Uh, for instance, we announced that the July 4th celebration or Summerfest uh, would not be held in person. It would be a virtual event. Uh, we have had some really good successes. Uh, the Gazers Brook, Brook Festival um, has been held virtually. And really, you know, we've actually started to look at whether we would offer some additional book service, uh, book festival programming throughout the year um, to help facilitate that. Next slide. I wanted to mention some of the key departments because those are the uh, most common places that we have the public interface. Uh, one of them is planning and code permit and inspections. In phase one, we would be allowing for people to um, schedule an appointment. Um, those numbers are listed there and they would be able to work through the permitting process. We currently already have been providing those services virtually, um, but sometimes individuals would like to prefer to come and talk to somebody in person and that will be able to be accommodated. We will also be increasing inspections as we move forward in phase one. With phase two, we will expand those services to occupied buildings kind of subject to the health and safety protocols um, that are recommended uh, by industry and the CDC. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about neighborhood services and animal control. Um, we have been providing exterior code inspections and animal control control services in a limited capacity up to this point. And in phase one, which again would start on June 15th, those services will be expanded by providing appointment-based meetings and tree removal inspections. In phase two, uh, further expansion would be provided by proactively um, inspecting rental housing, um, home-based business inspections, and some interior property inspections. Community services, 
next slide, is one of the departments who has been most impacted in terms of the COVID. They have done an outstanding job of providing needed services such as coordinating food distribution programs, housing assistance programs, and connecting residents with area resources. They probably had the most change in what type of programs they're offering and coordinating. So in this case, we would like all the other facilities um, asking um, in phase one, we won't be doing in-person um, appointments. We would be looking at trying to do those through email and teleconferencing. And as we move into phase two, uh, the lobby area would be open for appointments and interactions related to that. The next slide will talk about police and public safety. Um, as you know, our officers have been actively engaged in our communities, including coordinating community support events uh, throughout the pandemic. The changes between the phases are really focused on opening up the lobby services, uh, much of which has been done virtually. So paying tickets um, or getting uh, case reports, that's all been handled virtually. So in phase two, we would open up the lobby for a little bit more activity. And then we would also be looking to try to support small community events uh, permitted subject to the gathering number restrictions in place uh, by the state or the county. Next slide. Another department that's been actively engaged since the initial stay at home orders were put in place has been the public works department. Um, as the phases move forward, we will be increasing services. Some of those we have already started. Uh, the compost drop-off uh, for food compost at the Public Works facility reopened on May 20th. Uh, bulky item pickup uh, resumed the first week in June and will continue um, on the regular schedule uh, for now. Again, that schedule is basically the first week of every month on your recycling day. And then the curb leaf collection will occur in the fall as normally planned. Next slide. Probably one of the hardest groups of activities and services to determine when they might be available are those services and activities provided by the Parks, Recreation, and Culture Department. These services are highly dependent on decisions by outside government agencies like the state and county health departments and other permitting agencies. In addition, you know, Many of these services require registration lead times that will need to be factored in before um, they can officially resume. We have on play, parks, playgrounds, and picnic pavilions. Up to this point, we have allowed access to the parks uh, for exercise and enjoyment. Um, we will begin to open up picnic pavilions and playgrounds as soon as the gathering number restrictions, which is currently at 10, are increased uh, by the governor or the health uh, county executive. Some of that's also dependent on the recommendations from the county health department. I would point out that in these facilities, since they are not staffed and really because they're outside facilities cannot be sanitized effectively, uh, when they do open back up, we are asking residents um, to take the proper health and safety precautions and follow the CDC recommended guidelines when participating in these activities. The next slide, please. The activity center um, in phase one will be open for appointments, uh, mostly for discussion about upcoming programs um, that are anticipated to be um, put on as part of phase two. In phase two, we will be expanding the use of the facility based again on the gathering restrictions and physical distancing protocols um, put in place by the state or the county. I will note that registration uh, began today for approximately 30 virtual classes that will start at the beginning of July. In addition, we will be offering limited capacity outdoor fitness classes, including Zumba, yoga, meditation, starting at the end of uh, June. And again, those are dependent upon uh, the gathering restrictions put in place by the state or the county. Next slide. Casey Community Center uh, really will be um, restricted in terms of its uses and rentals in phase one. We will be allowing individuals to come and talk or see those facilities for future rentals. Um, that can be done by calling the number uh, listed in the presentation. 
And again, as most facilities in the parks and recs, we will begin expanding the use of the facility um, in phase two based upon the gathering restrictions. One of the things to point out is many of our uh, normal camp programs were traditionally held at school facilities um, and they may not be available for city use um, during the summer. So we are looking at other options and Casey is one of those buildings uh, that traditionally does not have a summer camp or a day camp. Uh, we would be looking at trying to operate one from there should they be allowed to operate um, under the state and county guidelines. Next slide. The Arts Barn facility, um, it's probably one of our harder facilities too, although it does have a number of components. Uh, in phase one, the facility will remain closed. In phase two, we'll be opening up the lobby entrance and we'll allow the gallery um, given the restrictions in place by the state or the county. It's unlikely that any performances will be um, held until phase three, um, just to based on how the facilities are laid out. And again, the Arts Barn is another one of those facilities that we might look towards repurposing as part of our summer uh, daycare camp provisions. Next slide. The Kentlands Mansion is, is very similar to the Arts Barn. Uh, the use and rentals will be restricted in phase one. And as we move to phase two, we will allow for individual and group use, including rentals um, based upon state and county restrictions. Some of the more traditional summer programs, um, next slide, such as miniature golf. Uh, under phase one, the facility will remain closed and we'll begin preparing for the activities. In phase two, we will be open for entry based upon uh, the restrictions put in place by the state or the county. Uh, we are looking at ways to kind of facilitate that through time slot reservations, um, and those will be announced on our website. Probably the one, next slide, the one that we get the most questions about, of course, because it's summer and it's already 90 degrees, is the water park. And the water park, again, is one of a uh, pretty complex um, program that we actually offer in the sense that there's a lot of permitting related to Montgomery County health in normal years. And in this year in particular, there will be additional safety and protocols required in order for us to receive our permit. Currently, the county is determining um, all those safety and health protocols and still trying to determine whether they would allow permits for public pools um, to be accessed um, during the summer. Another complication that we have too is that the pool takes a large number of part-time staff to operate. And as you know, we currently would be open by now. We have not um, hired those staff, although most of them are on standby. It will take us some time once the county and the state announce, I guess the state's already announced pool openings, but when the county allows for pools to open, if it does, it will take us some time to train staff on the new protocols um, that would be in place under uh, the permit. If we are allowed to open, uh, we do wanna make everybody aware that it's gonna be a gradual opening. We would probably look at trying to operate um, swim lanes um, on an appointment basis for the first couple of weeks of that opening and then make determinations on whether we could safely open up the pool to additional activities. It is likely if we're going to be able to do that, it would be in a limited capacity. Uh, we would not probably be allowed full capacity and there may be some questions about whether we could actually operate all the slides uh, that we currently have in the facility. So with that in mind, uh, we would probably be limiting uh, pool access to residents and members, at least during phase two, and implement other things such as requiring clear bags um, for anything that is brought into the pool so we're not searching through um, individual backpacks or other um, containers. And then in closing, uh, next slide, I just want to thank the residents for their understanding as we begin to restore service and assure them that part of this decision process is how we can best ensure the health and safety of both the users of our facilities and staff. And 
I also really want to thank staff for all the work that has gone into developing these plans and their dedication to serve the community during this challenging time. Thanks very much, Dennis. Um, I, I know we all appreciate um, how difficult this time has been, how um, I hate to overuse the word unprecedented because everybody's been using it, but, but just, to, just to figure out not only how we're going to um, you know, sort of close down, it, but maintain essential operations and then come back out of it. We just, there's not a playbook for it. And uh, we appreciate the work you put into it. And by the way, um, the slides look great. Those are some, you found some really good pictures for those slides. Um, we, I have a feeling Neil, Neil may want to ask about the, about the farmer's market. Um, Cause we got a, we got sort of a very chastising, angry email today. So I, I, I'm going to, I'm, he hasn't raised his hand, but I'm going to point to Neil right now. Go ahead, Neil. All right, thanks. And I spoke to Dennis about the, that issue this afternoon as well. But um, yes, as, uh, as the mayor pointed out, um, we had a fairly testy email this afternoon from a resident uh, who was not understanding why the farmer's market has not reopened. Uh, and in fact, we, we understand that throughout the county, many farmer's markets were never closed down at all, or, or some were closed down and then reopened. So can we address that? directly and where our, what our city's position is on that and what the issues are with reopening the farmer's market here? Yeah, I believe, you know, when the initial um, stay at home order went into effect, one of the concerns we had, particularly with the Kentlands market, was the amount of space um, that was required um, in terms of distancing and the numbers. One of the other complexities that we have with our farmer's markets is they're not staffed. And so trying to assure compliance with those parameters is something that we've been discussing with the vendors. We are reevaluating the situation um, you know, as we speak, and we'll probably be looking at trying to open those back up. I will note that we did have a really unique program where Gaithersburg actually worked with a number of vendors that would do home delivery and then provided that information to the residents where they could call up pre-order and then the farmer's market or that vendor would deliver it. So we are looking at trying to make modifications. And as I noted before, as the circumstances changes, we are able to modify the plan and adapt and probably will be opening up those farmers markets in the near future. Any questions, comments for Dennis? Go ahead, Ryan. Um, I just want to offer my uh, praise to uh, Dennis and all the staff who were involved in putting this plan together. This is comprehensive, particularly when you consider uh, the scale of our jurisdiction relative to the county and the state and federal governments that are all grappling with putting together plans and, and directives for how to do this. The fact that uh, staff was able to come together and build our own rather specific individualized plan in these times, uh, I, I think, you know, really speaks uh, extraordinarily well uh, to all the staff who worked on this. So. I think it's so great, in fact, that um, you know, in my role as president of the Maryland Municipal League, I've been asked to reach out to municipalities who have uh, reopening plans that could be used as templates or even just to help create a bank of sample plans for um, our member municipalities around the state to use, take a look at, rely on. Um, when I uh, saw the Gaithersburg plan and the background materials for tonight's meeting, I immediately forwarded on to the MML staff because I just thought it was such an excellent template for potentially other municipalities to look at and, um, and work from. So again, thanks to all of staff uh, for putting this important document together. And we understand that is, it is an iterative document and it will depend on uh, new information coming out from the state and the county in the coming days and weeks, but it's still an incredible piece of work product. So thank you. Um, you've already highlighted, Dennis, the many questions that we're receiving from the community and the interests about things like playgrounds and pools. I know that you and the rest of staff will continue to keep the public updated on those kinds of things and summer camp programs as we're trying to work and figure out how to apply um, the, the county executive orders that, that cover Gaithersburg. 
Um, quick question about the passport services that we have provided at City Hall. Uh, would they fall under phase two, phase three? How might that work? I believe they're under phase two is when we're gonna try to implement those on an appointment basis, just similar to what it is today. Great, okay. thank you. Lorian. Thank you, Mayor. Dennis, thank you for that very um, informative uh, presentation. Um, I think Ryan has given enough kudos, but I can't agree that, you know, we are very proud that we have a plan moving forward to respond uh, as we slowly uh, reopen the city. Um, I was going to ask about PPE equipment. I know that the barriers were discussed um, that they would be installed for one-on-ones or um, customer um, with visitors that come to the city for services. What if a visitor comes during the phase one or two when um, they don't have the proper equipment? Are we providing disposable masks to attendees? And then I wanted to ask about what we're doing for staff as they continue to come back and their PPE equipment for our staff, um, our police officers. Is it required or is it optional? Yeah, as a component that we haven't presented here tonight. There's actually a kind of a sister document that goes with this, which kind of outlines the guidelines and expectations for staff regarding all the protocols related to reopening. And so we go through the different aspects of the PPE that we are providing to them. Uh, they're required to take training on that PPE. There are some common elements that are common, to, you know, applicable to all employees and then some employees have additional equipment that their departments will be training on. And there's also additional cleaning protocols that staff will be implementing um, along with that PP&E um, in high touch areas or in mail rooms or things like that. We will be providing, should someone come to City Hall, mm -hmm. a mask for them and then hand sanitizer at each location. And also, you know, the restrooms will be open uh, for washing your hands. And so those have all been looked at. You know, the senior leadership team did a great job of uh, doing this side document, which we call the guidelines document. Uh, last week, we actually had depart meetings with every department, uh, sometimes down to the division level based upon the size, explaining the document, talking through the document, and how and what the expectations were uh, for staff. I will note that we're still going to have a high tele work component uh, for those staff that can continue to do that, but we will provide minimal staffing to each of the facilities, the core facilities in phase one, and then as we move to phase two, uh, the other facilities depending on their use. Okay, and I, I look forward to hearing about, you know, the future status of our summer camp programs. I'm just imagining kids like, elementary school kids and forcing them to social distance during activities and during the summer and how challenging that is going to be. I just cannot imagine how you guys and Carolyn are going to uh, make that decision, but look forward to hearing more. And then um, I had a question about our seniors. I know you said that there's uh, quite a few classes that are coming out um, virtually. And I was wondering if there are any programs for our seniors that are included in those. Yeah, we actually have already been providing some programs to seniors. Uh, the senior center is a little bit different in that we have membership requirements. And so we're able to push those out a little bit easier because uh, we have contact information. So even prior to phase one, we have been doing some exercise programs with them and we'll continue to offer those. And as everybody knows, uh, this population for the senior center are one of the at-risk um, groups. Mm -hmm. So the senior center is probably, it's going to be the one of the last facilities we open. So okay. that probably would not occur until phase three unless mm -hmm. there's some change in the COVID epidemic. Okay, all right. And my last question, well, no, that's it, that's it. Thank you, Dennis. Hey, I just, I wanted to, oh, 
I see we got Rob. We'll go to Rob and then we'll go to Mike. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Dennis, for the, the informative presentation. Um, just two questions. One is, as I recall, when we were um, going to the, the, the telework um, scenario, we had essential personnel coming in. We had adopted an enhanced compensation um, uh, plan, I guess, for, for for hourly employees and for for salaried employees. There was um, enhanced comp time. I think it was something like that. Is that still in place? And if it is, is in, under what scenario does that get phased out, or what considerations are you looking at with respect to each of the phases and providing the, the the, that type of compensation scheme. As you're aware, you know, the city, when it adopted its budget, looked at the uh, impact of COVID and, you know, the reduction that we were anticipating was around $4 million in terms of revenue reduction. So about that same time, as you pointed out, initially when we went um, to teleworking and providing kind of essential services in March of this year, we did do time and a half. Uh, plus some compensation for exempt employees. A few weeks back, we actually uh, modified that plan based upon our financial uh, situation or what we would anticipate the reduction in our financial revenues um, to be more of an hourly rate in increase. And that was $5 if you had uh, public facing um, positions and then $250 if you were just doing other positions that weren't uh, publicly facing. And then we did uh, eliminate the additional compensation to exempt employees. With phase one, we would basically um, not do any compensation differential uh, for any employees in the organization. We are still providing in terms of some flex time, in terms of some of the schedules for police department and public works uh, to limit the number of people who are um, currently reporting to work and providing some additional time for those employees, either who have childcare or who um, don't have enough work teleworking official leave. That will also start to be phased out as we reopen our facilities in phase two. Okay, thank you. And so the, the second question is, um, I guess not necessarily related to the phased reopening of city services, but more uh, related to the the uh, legacy outcome on the impact legacy impacts on our workforce and how we manage our workforce in situ or remote um, and I would just encourage as we're looking at um, phase reopening we do lessons learned on how we can um, bring our workforce's situation into the 21st century and adopt flexible and telework policies that will um, go uh, well beyond this this uh, temporary situation of, of, of you know, where we have telework. Um, not necessarily a part of this presentation, but just wanted to point it out that that, that is a heavy emphasis of mine. Um, and I would encourage staff to think of ways to carry um, the idea forward um, beyond the temporary situation we're in. I think every city in the nation is reevaluating what uh, its workforce looks like and where it reports to, um, along with other businesses in our community and across the nation. So we will be definitely looking at that. We've already had discussions at the senior leadership uh, team level about what that might look like. Um, and the hope would be we would have some definitive kind of conclusion of what our structure would look like before or about the same time we move to phase three. Mike. Yeah, that last point, you know, I think when we uh, voted on the strategic plan at uh, our last meeting, I, I did uh, uh, mention, I thought in terms of both in terms of city administration and in the services that we provide, that we, we needed to look forward about how we were gonna make all of these things available in the event that uh, this happens again, and, and the fact that we're still in the emergency that we are. And I think it bears repeating that even though things seem to be letting up and I think people are more relaxed about uh, reopening and wanting to get out, there is a sense uh, of safety that isn't uh, 
uh, isn't supported by the evidence out there. We, you know, it's not safe out there for many people. Uh, it is still a very virulent uh, uh, virus, uh, highly infectious, and none of us are safe from it uh, until there's a vaccine, and a vaccine won't be available for at least, well, not before the end of the year. Uh, it's unlikely to be available uh, until the end of the year, and even then, we don't know the level of uh, safety that that's going to provide. So. There are still many people that are very vulnerable to this, uh, and certainly uh, infection is going to affect people differently. Some people will hardly feel it, and other people, uh, it's, it's going to be fatal for others. So we have to keep that in mind, and I think I, didn't, I wasn't a recipient of the flaming email today, or whatever it was that, that you, uh, several of you referred to earlier, so I don't know what that is. And I understand the frustration of people that want to get out and want to resume life as normal, but life isn't going to be normal until we have a vaccine, until we have herd immunity. That's, that's years away. So I think the precautions that uh, staff has taken and worked together to develop this plan are uh, uh, well constructed and uh, doing, you know, providing what the best we can provide in terms of protecting both uh, the staff and all of the residents uh, and our consumers of our services as much as possible. We have to keep that in mind. But I don't think we should. Uh, I think that that we're we're taking the right appropriate precautions and doing it carefully and providing and using the guidance provided both by the county health department. Uh, uh, by the CDC and by our own personal judgment uh, and professional judgment. So look, I work for a major health agency in the United States, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I've been able, unfortunately, I've been able to telework for 10 weeks now. In my particular job, uh, my institute, we are not going back to work on site probably until the fall. So um, you know, I, I think from uh, my perspective as a scientist, as a, as a health, prof health professional, health scientist professional, uh, there's something to be said in observing how many agencies are going back to work. Uh, and the reason it's taking time is because I think we're following the important, we're taking the appropriate precautions and we're being very cautious about it. And other, you know, that's, that's the phase that that we're going through. So keep that in mind, and I hope the public keeps that in mind. And I hope, you know, we're asking the public to be patient. This, hopefully this is the only time this is gonna happen in our lifetime. Um, but uh, precaution uh, is, is, is what we need to take at this point. And, uh, uh, we're doing this for everybody and not just uh, to make lives, uh, you know, there, there's good intentions here and I think that's what's important. So thank you for all the planning that staff has done. Um, and thank you for the planning that we're going to do going forward in terms of both how we operate our services and, and take care of uh, our citizens. That's it, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody, Dennis. I it seems like uh, you're, you're dealing with some uh, universal appreciation here for, for what you've put together. Uh, so thank you. Um, do you have any, anything more or? Really just to say it's really staff. I mean, it's everybody coming together, uh, developing the plans, understanding the plans, and then helping you know, implement those plans. And as Mike pointed out, you know, there's always the potential that we might have to reverse those based upon what's happening in our own environment. And we are using safety as a primary goal uh, when we re-implement services. I, I had a quick question, Mayor. Um, Dennis, um, I don't know, I, you mentioned that everyone in the staff is uh, contributing to this uh, program. Um, ha has staff been surveyed or um, to assess their concerns or one of the things, we haven't done a formal survey, but again, 
Uh, last week we held department meetings, you know, in some cases down to the division level where we had discussions about how people were feeling, if they had questions about the proposed plans. And that was just at the, the larger level. So there were members of the SLT, the supervisors, and myself were in those meetings. And then the supervisors are also um, kind of individually meeting with staff and talking about these issues again. Uh, one of the things that we've also planned is to do some check-ins. So that first week that we open up, we will be doing city-wide staff Zoom meetings, which are fairly interesting um, as an opportunity for staff to kind of give some feedback. How are things working? Are there additional concerns? Um, we'll be doing two of those next week um, during that first um, part of phase one. And then as we move to each phase, we'll continue that process. Uh, so staff has the ability to kind of check in. Um, and again, we've also reiterated that if staff is uncomfortable or has questions, they can check with their supervisor or the department head and even myself um, with any concerns they might have. Okay, and I'm sorry, I had one last question. Are there, I didn't, I don't know if I may have missed it, but will there be temperature checks when we do start to reopen? There won't be temperature checks for employees. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about whether that was practical for us and whether it really, um, you know, I think a lot of industries are doing it, but it's just one of the symptoms. So we have taken the approach of self-certification and asking the employees before they report to work each day um, to make sure they do that, along with check to see whether they have any other symptoms. In addition to people coming into the facility, uh, we will have signs posted um, talking about those issues um, with them that they should make sure they are symptom free before they come in. There will be some temperature taking probably if we are able to implement, um, you know, some of the camp programs or, you know, those programs will require under the CDC and health regulations temperature taking of um, at least individuals who are attending those um, each day before they are admitted into the facility. But we will not be doing that wholesale to either staff or to the public in general. Um, we felt there were better options. Um, and also just based on it's only one symptom. Um, just making people cognizant that they shouldn't come to work if they're sick or they shouldn't come to a city facility if they're sick. Um, and that goes for not just COVID, but you know, if somebody gets a cold or other things, they are more likely um, to be have a greater exposure risk, um, even if they come to a facility and you know, something happens. The reality is at some point we will have um, someone test positive within our workforce um, and we will take appropriate um, precautions regarding cleaning of facilities when that happens. If either someone who's using our facility or an employee test positive, we do have protocols in place uh, for sanitation and all of those things. Okay. So it could require us closing down a building for uh, 24 hours is the current recommendation under CDC. So we may have to close down either a portion of a facility or the entire facility, depending on what the exposure risk was. Okay. Okay. Lorian, looks like you have inspired uh, more questions. Ryan, did I see your hand up? Oh no, that was just a stretch. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, before we go, anything from Lynn? You've been very quiet the whole time. Okay, easy meeting for you. Okay, well, um, then this will conclude our two discussion items for this evening. I will note that um, this weekend we do have, this is our last formal weekend of the book festival, virtual book festival programming. We have programs on uh, Friday, Saturday, two on Sunday. Uh, we are working on sort of a bonus program, but we don't have a date for that yet, and there'll be an announcement. Um, also wanted to note that it, the Watkins Mill Interchange may be opening any day now. We got a, um, I got an email from SHA uh, last Wednesday or Thursday asking if I would record a 30 second <laughs> uh, a video of me, to, uh, you know, that they can use as part of their virtual ribbon cutting for Watkins Mill Interchange. And I did it but I have no idea when it's going to air or what, what day it's actually going to open, but it may, it could be any day now. So. The um, road signs say June 10th, Mr. Mayor. So if it's a different date, you're going to have a lot of irate people. Okay. 
Well, I, I don't know. I don't know that we should have the irate people. Maybe they'll come to us. They'll blame um, government for not opening their interchange as promised. <laughs> but yeah, no, this anyway, so it could be a sign, say well, June. Well, look, Moco show posted uh, June tenth, so it must be true. <laughs> okay, we had gotten June tenth as well. I just, I yeah. just hadn't heard for sure that that was that was happening. So. Um, that we should prepare our own uh, kind of virtual ribbon cutting. Uh, Dennis, do you feel guided there? I do. We can put something together. And it is, uh, to our knowledge, it is June 10th, and it's the full interchange. Okay. Um, All right. And last time I checked, June 10th is Wednesday. So that's coming right up. So um, could be Rob? I'm sorry. Since we're on Watkins Mill Interchange, can I just give extremely – uh, boisterous kudos to Dennis for and and for my community to Dennis for the installation of a, a traffic signal at Forest Preserve which was not in the original plans at all and it was through Dennis's efforts in coordinating with the state and the county that the signal is there they were testing it today so thank you and that again it takes all staff it's not just me <laughs> um, there are a number of staff behind the scenes uh, talking with the county because that is actually a portion of the county's portion of Watkins Mill interchange. So um, we did not install the light. That's a county installation. As Rob has indicated, it has been a long journey for that installation. So on that note, I think, yeah, there's some other intersections uh, in the area that we're going to have to take a close look at in terms of traffic control and then uh, streets through certain neighborhoods. We're going to have to be uh, very observant about how that traffic might change coming up. So. And we do have funding in FY21, Mike, as um, you know, for those particular right. improvements. Great. All right. Uh, all that said, uh, next regular meeting of the Mayor Council is next week, uh, a week from today, June 15th. Until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. <laughs>